But we continue with Systematic Theology, Lesson 6, Part 2, The Doctrine Concerning Angels. In Part 1, we find out what angels really were and how they compared to humans, etc. In this part, we're going to consider some other details concerning angels. So we begin with question number 10. Are angels of equal power and rank? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. If there is an archangel, which means arch, meaning first, then there must be others of inferior rank. They are also spoken of as different ranks in dignity and power. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. Verse 11. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. In the book of Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah saw ten visions. Here in chapter 1 is recorded the first one. Verse 8 relates to us what Zechariah saw in the first vision. There was a man called my Lord, verse 9, and the angel or messenger of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and talked with him. The angel stood in the midst with mixed colored horses and the back guarding his own people. Zechariah inquired of the angel, perhaps Gabriel, the informing angel, just what the meaning of this first vision was. And the angel replied that he would explain it to him. Verse 10 relates that the man, angel or messenger of Jehovah, that stood among the myrtle trees guarding Israel, verse 8, told Zechariah that these, represented by speckled horses, were a myriad of protecting or guardian angels that walked through the earth to defend God's chosen people from Satan's powers as he walked about seeking whom he might devour. Verse 11 tells of the response of these horse riders over the earth and their observation that peace and rest covered the earth. The Persian wars had ceased and Judah and Israel lingered, delayed in rebuilding the house of God, though a remnant had returned to Jerusalem and their homeland. Daniel chapter 10 verse 13 But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now verse 13 explains that this angelic informer was sent to Daniel, was delayed for 120 days by the prince or the demon-controlled angel or maybe even Lucifer himself until Michael, commander and chief of heaven's defensive protector and angelic band, came to the rescue of this angel Gabriel. As a patron defender of Israel before God, he helped to influence Persia, the Persian kings, to permit the Jews to return to Jerusalem. This angel Gabriel concludes that he refused to leave the Persian kings until he received help from Michael to achieve the release of the remnant Jews to return to their homeland and their city, Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Every one of them shall be found written in the book. This verse 1 specifically and definitively states the following will happen. Michael, the great archangel of God's protectorate for the children of thy people, 
Daniel's national people, Israel, will appear to preserve her. Jude 9 Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Michael the archangel is the chief or ruling angel who heads the angelic protectorate host over God's people. He's mentioned five times in the scriptures. Each time he singularly or with his angelic host is set to protect or defend God's children. From this angelic dominion, each child of God has an eternal angelic protector watching, guarding, protecting him or her, as the case may be, by day and by night through life. There are many passages of Scripture which relate to this. Psalm 34, 7. Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Acts 27, verses 22 through 25. And Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. All these passages refer to the angels providing protection for God's children and even others. Though Scripture does not warrant us to believe that each individual has his particular guardian angel, it teaches very explicitly that the angels minister to every Christian. They merely indicate that God employs the ministry of angels to deliver his people from affliction and danger, and that the angels do not think it below their dignity to minister even to children and to the least among Christ's disciples. Are the angels organized? Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Revelation 19 and verse 14. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. All of these passages of Scripture give us ample evidence that the angels are indeed organized. They appear to be of divers or different orders. Since seraphims and cherubims are mentioned in Isaiah and Ezekiel, let's take a look at them before we continue on. The following is taken from ChristCenteredMall.com, teaching angels. I do not know who the author is. I wish I did so they could give him credit for this, but nevertheless, this is the source of what I'm using the next several slides. Seraphims and cherubims are winged creatures that appear in Scripture and make their most memorable appearances in the visions of Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. Ezekiel 1, 4 through 28, and Ezekiel 10. 3 through 22, Isaiah 6, verses 2 through 6, and Book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 7. Now, although they're not specifically called angels, cherubim and seraphim are revealed as living creatures or heavenly beings whose primary purpose is to worship God at his throne. Seraphims only appear in Isaiah's vision. Isaiah saw the Lord seated on a throne, and seraphims stood over the throne, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory is the fullness of the whole earth. You find that in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Seraphim means the burning ones or flying serpents. They were similar to cherubim, but had six wings two of which covered their face, two of which covered their feet, and with two wings they flew. What was Isaiah's reaction? He said, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. That's chapter 6, verse 5. He saw his own inadequacy and sinfulness when he encountered the holiness of God. But then one of the seraphim touched Isaiah's lips with the live coal from the altar, and God gave Isaiah a message for the people of Judah. Cherubim, also called cherubs, 
are revealed as powerful guards or attendants to the divine throne. God placed cherubims and a flaming sword at the Garden of Eden to guard the way of the tree of life. And you'll find that in Genesis 3 and verse 24. In the tabernacle and also the temple, gold cherubim figures on the mercy seat signified the presence of God. You find that referred to in Exodus chapter 37 verses 7 through 9. Numbers chapter 7 verse 89 and in Psalm 80 and verse 1. In Ezekiel's vision, he saw cherubim as living creatures next to the throne of God, worshiping and serving him. The cherubim had four faces, man, lion, ox, and eagle. Although Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 14 replaces the face of the ox with the face of a cherub. Each living creature possessed four wings, two of which covered their bodies and two of which extended upwards. They traveled on what appeared to be a wheel within a wheel, according to Ezekiel 1.16, and went in any direction with great speed, like a flash of lightning. Their appearance was brilliant like fire, and their wings made noise like a great waterfall. Now, what was Ezekiel's reaction? He fell on his face, completely overtaken by the glory of God. Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Revelation 12:7 And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. In Jesus Christ existed the cause of the creation. The creator is therefore logically to be subject to the lordship of its creator. Jesus was also the agent of creation. Even positions of divine angelic service were made by him, whether they exist as thrones, positions of present angelic service to God and the redeemed from which good angels operate, or dominions, that is, or lordships, positions of jurisdictional divine service over which Michael, Gabriel, seraphims, and cherubims direct angelic service or principalities, or rulers, or governments of the unseen world of angelic service, or powers, or authorities existing in the angelic realm of service to God and the redeemed. The verse says, all things were created by him and for him. Him meaning Jesus. Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 and there was war in heaven and there occurred developed or became a war in heaven this was in the presence of and before the central throne of God Michael and his angels fought against the dragon Michael and his angels the angels of his jurisdiction into warfare or battle with the dragon the serpent the devil Michael is revealed to be God's chief defensive archangel who defends God's properties, causes, and people against the devil. And the dragon fought in his angels, and the dragon warred, fought, or battled in his angels with those, that is, against those of Michael and his angels. This passage certifies that the dragon, the devil, owns, has slave control over his angels or demon spirits who battle with him against God, Michael, and his host of angelic defenders of holy people and causes. So thus, we find much evidence that the angels are in ranks, orders, and are very much organized. So we come to question 12. Were angels all originally holy? In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So the answer to that question is yes. However, 
As finite creatures, they may fall under temptation, and accordingly we read of fallen angels. Of the cause and manner of their fall, we're wholly ignorant. We only know that they left their first estate. Question 13, did any of them fall? In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. Then we look at Jude, verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So the answer to this question is, of course, yes. Of the cause and manner of their fall, we are wholly ignorant. We only know that they left their first estate. So question 14, what is the employment of the good angels? Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Luke chapter 15, verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So the answer is, their name indicates their agency in the dispensations of providence towards man. And the Bible abounds in narratives of events in which they have borne a visible part. Yet in this employment they act as the mere instruments of God and in fulfillment of His commands. Angels minister to every Christian. They are specifically God's angels and carry on His great work of redemption. They appear to rebuke idolatry. The incarnation of Jesus introduces a new era in the administrations of angels. They come with their Lord to earth to do Him service while here. They predict his advent and minister to him after his temptation and glory. They declare his resurrection and ascension. They rejoice over a penitent sinner. They bear the souls of the redeemed to paradise. And they will be the ministers of judgment hereafter on the great day. There are many passages of scripture that bear out all that I've mentioned and have not included them for the sake of time. So question 15, should angels be worshipped? Colossians chapter 2 verse 18, Let no man beguile you of your reward and the voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The answer is no, they are not to be worshipped. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, we find John the Revelator stating, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the angel told John that he was not to worship angels because they were fellow servants along with the saints. They were to worship God. Question 16. Do God's people have protecting angels? Well, let's look at 1 Kings 19, verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Now this was the prophet Elijah. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. This is one of the passages of Scripture that Satan misused in his temptation of Jesus. This passage of Scripture has reference to saints, not Jesus. Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. My God hath sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. 
here again God had sent angels to keep the lions from harming Daniel when he was thrown into the lion's den. Matthew 4, verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits? Send forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So the answer to this question would be from all of these passages of Scripture and many others, the answer would be a definite yes. The Matthew passage has reference to Jesus, but let me point out that at that time Jesus was still in the flesh. Now, I do not know if we always have the same angels attending to us or if they are different ones all the time. But we definitely do have some that protect us and minister to us. Question number 17. Does God use angels as ministers of vengeance? Look at Second Kings chapter 19 and verse 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians one hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Acts 12. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. So we can gather from these passages that the answer to this question is a a yes. Again, these passages are but two of many others that illustrate this answer. Question number 18. Who will come to the world with Jesus Christ and his second advent? In Matthew chapter 25 verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So the answer to this question is quite clear. The angels. Question 19. To whom are the fallen angels subject? Again in chapter 25 of Matthew, verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It's very evident from this passage that Satan would be the one to whom they are subject. They followed him in his rebellion and have remained under his direction ever since. This subject is but one third of a broader subject of angels, demons, and spiritual warfare. There's much more to know on just this one part of the subject. But let us conclude that angels have much to do with the saints. I believe that we are not spiritual enough to see and communicate with them, but that's an entirely different subject in itself.